On this week's Nesson Patriots podcast, we will discuss the impending return of Rex Burkhead. We will recap the Patriots' win over the Jets and preview their upcoming matchup against the Vikings. Welcome to the Nesson Patriots podcast. I'm Doug Kite, joined as always by Zach Cox. I guess it's not as always anymore since you weren't here last week. I know. I think that was my first uh, DNP that I've had since we started doing the podcast a couple years. Or I might have had one more like last year, but that I've, might have been a different podcast name at that point. <laughs> I think it probably was. That's probably in our between the tackles days. Yes. But yeah, I spent uh, spent Thanksgiving week over over in Dublin, over back in the uh, the homeland. Um, so yeah, I you I feel like you and Nora held it down though. We did. We held it down as best as we possibly could, and you did make it back in time for the Patriots' win over the Jets. Barely. <laughs> Barely, yeah. You, uh, what, did you fly from Dublin to Iceland to Boston to Newark to East Rutherford? Yeah. You didn't a, fly from Newark to East Rutherford. That would be a short it, flight. It was about an 18 and a half hour journey. Got in late Saturday <laughs> night, left very, very early Saturday morning. So, yeah, quite the voyage, but uh, made it there in time for a wildly exciting Patriots <laughs> Jets game sarcasm yeah. there. And I mean, yeah, it was it was a it was a fine game. It was one of those games where I think we talked about this a little bit uh possibly on our drive back. I didn't make you fly back through Dublin <laughs> and Iceland. I should have just done those the loop again. Yeah, you really should have though. I mean quite a journey. <laughs> um it's one of those games where like yes, the Patriots won, but I don't think that Patriots fans will really take away anything greatly positive out of that because the Patriots were supposed to win. They were, what, favored probably by like 13 and a half points or something like that? It was a double-digit spread, I'm pretty sure. And they won by 14. So, like, they basically did exactly what they were supposed to do, and they really didn't totally get going until really late in the game there. Yeah, I mean, this this sort of thing kind of happens every time the Patriots go down to MetLife Stadium. This was actually their most lopsided win over the Jets since the um, since the butt fumble game back wow. in 2012. Um, it always seems to be a one possession game, and that seems like seemed like kind of where this game was trending. They played a very sloppy first half, just a ton of penalties, yeah. some kind of missed opportunities, and then they were able to turn it on in the second half. And um, I believe they shut the Jets out in the second half. They might have held them to a to one field goal. The defense played well against the Jets offense that obviously is not particularly talented, and the the Patriots took care of business. I mean, I don't think you can come out of this game with any kind of additional worries about the Patriots that right. you didn't have going into this game. It was, it was, like you said, it was a fine performance. It wasn't anything that's going to really change the narrative surrounding this team. But, I mean, the running game had its best performance mm-hmm. since 2014, I believe. It was the first time they'd rushed over over 200 yards in a game since 2014. Rob Gronkowski made an impact, had his first touchdown since week one. So a lot of good things to take away from this game. And then going into uh, the, the game this week against a much more talented uh, Minnesota Vikings team. Yeah, I, like you said, running game was really good. I thought it was Sonny Michelle's best game of the season. Uh, good performance out of Gronk. I think that, you know, he just continues to so, show flashes yeah. of vintage, dominant Gronk. It w- definitely wasn't a complete Gronk performance. Because right. outs- outside of that one touchdown catch, and he had a, another, I think, 17-yard catch, he was basically shut down by, by Jabal Adams. Right. but. Basically, for someone who really hadn't played in a month and who hadn't looked right since, like, September, it was a a solid step in the right direction for him, I thought. Yeah, and, I mean, he he kind of... He's been showing these flashes of dominant Gronk kind of all season. I mean, he he was 100% himself in Week 1, and then in the fourth quarter against Chiefs, he made uh, some big plays. The touchdown they had against the Jets was a big play. He made a big catch against... Was it the Bills? Yeah, he had one... one, Yeah. uh, yeah, so nice goal line one then. He there. just keeps like showing enough glimpses of being his old self that I do think that by the end of the season he will put it all together for at least one or two more dominant performances and then maybe that will continue into the playoffs. Uh, but you know, one of the biggest things out of this game against the Jets was Julian Edelman's performance as yeah. well. I think he's kind of flown under the radar so far this season, but I feel like a lot more people are actually starting to notice that he's been one of the Patriots' best players since coming off that suspension uh, after catching four passes for 84 yards and a touchdown against the Jets. I thought it was a, a good, complete overall performance by him. I totally agree. I mean, he hasn't really had a bad game since no. he came back, um, which I know we were a little bit, I don't know if skeptical might be too strong of a word, but we weren't really sure what we were going to see from Julian Edelman, given that he missed all of last season with the injury. He, he's getting up there in age. He yeah. had a suspension, but he's been fantastic, really, ever since he came back in um 
in week five, he'd be on pace for, for over 1,000 yards yeah. if he played a, uh, played a full season. He's already up to, what is he at, 510 uh, receiving yards, three touchdowns, 44 catches in seven games. That's, that's exactly what you want from Julian Edelman. Yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing. I, Edelman, Josh Gordon, and Rob Gronkowski are all on pace for like eight or 900 yards this season, which means that, I mean, if any or all of those players finish the season strong – some, none, all could be over a thousand yards by the end of the season. It's not like out of the realm of possibility. And I don't think that many people would know that based on, you know, how they're perceived to be, perceived to be playing right now. Yeah. And Sonny Michelle is on pace for 952 rushing yards. So he could easily get over a thousand as well. I think, yeah, it goes to show with this, the complaints about Rob Gronkowski this season, how he hasn't looked like vintage Rob Gronkowski, which he hasn't. He hasn't looked nearly as dominant as he has in years past. But he's still, I mean, he's played in eight games. He has 500 receiving yards. That puts him on pace for 1,000 receiving yards if he was healthy for every game. Sony Michel is, still could end up getting over 1,000 rushing yards, and he's been dealt with all of those injuries. Uh, people had the whole uh, premature bust label going on <laughs> with him earlier in the season. So, yeah, I mean, all the Patriots' top offensive weapons, well, maybe they haven't been playing at kind of their their peak level at all times, they're all still having pretty solid seasons. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Gronk, like you said, 504 yards. This seems unlikely based on how his season's going so far, but if he averaged 99 yards over the last five games of the season, he would be up over 1,000, which is kind of amazing to think about with all the, you know, with all the talk of of how he struggled. Uh, Another thing on defense, I thought the Patriots pass rush did a really nice job in this game. Uh, Trey Flowers had another good game rushing the passer. I thought Adam Butler might have had his best game rushing the passer. Dietrich Wise was getting after the quarterback a decent amount. They hit uh, Josh McCown, one, two, six, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 times. Uh, which is, I mean, that's a lot of quarterback hits, especially for the Patriots this season. Yeah, McCown was under pressure a lot this game. I think the pressure by, I believe it was Flowers and John Simon basically forced, yep. um, uh, resulted in the interception for Stephon Gilmore, who also had a great bounce back yes. game. I know you wrote about this right after the game. It was really kind of a, uh, a return to form for, for both Flowers and mm-hmm. Gilmore, who really struggled down in Tennessee a couple a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, it was, it was a solid over, overall performance by the Patriots. I mean, because the, they only allowed one touchdown to this Jets offense, and that came after kind of a boneheaded play by, by Dietrich Wise, a roughing the passer penalty, wiped away a, 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 what would have been a third down stop and a, a likely a field goal attempt. So overall, yeah, very... Uh, they, you're expecting you're, you expect your defense to play well against a team like the Jets, right. and, and the Patriots did take care of business there. Yeah, Gilmore allowed one catch on five targets for 17 yards with an interception and a pass breakup. Um, and it seems like, I, I don't know, like I'd have to look into this a little bit further, but when Flowers and Gilmore play to their fullest potential, the Patriots win and their defense is pretty dominant. Like that's that's kind of the way the season has gone so far this yeah. season. Where if those guys play like they should, then the Patriots' defense is in good shape. And if not, then they might struggle a little bit. And in the game against the Titans, both of those guys did really kind of struggle, and that's why the Patriots' defense played as poorly. As I speaks. I think it speaks to the fact about how the Patriots don't have a ton of, I guess, high end depth on defense. They really Gilmore and Flowers are really the only elite or even kind of high yeah. like very above average players they have on that defense so when one or more of those guys isn't playing well the defense really suffered I mean you saw that earlier in the season when um when Trey Flowers mm-hmm. missed the, the the Lions game and, and most of the Jaguars game the Patriots defense was a mess even though Stephon Gilmore was still playing reasonably well in both of those games so if both of those players are are kind of playing up to form then then this defense is is legitimately good and if if one or both of them aren't it, it gets really shaky in a hurry. Uh, one negative to take away from that game against the Jets was the play of Jonathan Jones, Patriots select cornerback. Uh, he kind of struggled against Jermaine Curse early in the game, and it seemed like he, I guess I'm not supposed to use this word, but he was like kind of benched during the game uh, for J.C. Jackson. Jackson. He only played 13 snaps, so you can, you right. can kind of say that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, Jackson wound up coming in in nickel situations or dime situations, whatever it would have been, uh, playing outside, which was then moving Jason McCourty into the slot. And I, before we get too far into the Vikings, we should discuss them a little bit as far as this is concerned, because the Vikings slot receiver is Adam Thielen, yep. who, as Bill Belichick mentioned uh, in his news conference this morning, 
is a tall receiver. He's six foot three. And I was asking Belichick about if they have to handle taller slot receivers differently than they handle shorter slot receivers. And Jonathan Jones is what five ten something, like, something that. like that. Yeah, most most slot corners tend to be smaller guys. Right. So he's better suited to cover those smaller guys. And it makes me wonder how the Patriots decide to handle Adam Thielen in this game against the Vikings because Thielen is, you know, one of the best wide receivers in the NFL, and they they really kind of have. They have maybe four or five choices, but one of the choices that they could do is use Stephon Gilmore on Adam Thielen, and that includes when he slides into the slot and just have him shadow him all over the field. I don't know about that because uh, they might be better suited with having Gilmore cover Stephon Diggs. Another possibility would just be to have Jason McCourty, since he has played in the slot a decent amount this season, have Jason McCourty shadow Thielen across the field, which might seem like it might be the best possibility. Yeah. The other like two or three possibilities would be to have either – Jonathan Jones cover Thielen, which doesn't seem like a good idea. Have rookie Duke Dawson cover Adam Thielen, which also doesn't seem like the greatest idea since it will be his NFL debut. It'll be a hell of a debut there. And then there you go, kid. Go cover <laughs> one of the best wide receivers in the NFL. Uh, another one, I guess, would be having Patrick Chung cover him when the when he's in the slot. Chung covered T. Y. Hilton a few years ago, but Chung just hasn't been quite as good in man coverage this season as he has been in years past. So. Not so sure about that one either. I, I would probably go with McCourty, but I think that Gilmore would do a good job as well. Yeah, I think the, the problem with Chung is just that um, Thielen is such a good route runner right. that he's been able to to shake some really talented cover cornerbacks this season. I don't know. I think not. – I'm not exactly sure how they're they're going to play this, obviously, but I do think maybe the, the smartest option or, or at least the one that seems to be right in my mind is using a similar setup that they had – uh, once J.C. Jackson came into this game this right. past weekend where they have Stephon Gilmore and J.C. Jackson on the outside and then Jason McCourty tra- um, playing with uh, with Thielen on the inside. Maybe you mix that up when, when there's only uh, two receivers in there and Thielen's on the outside. Maybe you have Stephon Gilmore covering him. Yeah. In those situations, I'm sure they will do some mixing and matching just because this the, the fact that the, the Vikings do have two highly, highly talented wide receivers, there, there's not a gigantic drop off from Adam Thielen to Stephon Diggs. I mean, he has what 79 catches for almost 800 yards and six touchdowns this season, mm-hmm. I think. So, he's having a very good season in his own right. He basically has better numbers than anybody on the Patriots, any receiver on the Patriots roster. So, I think you're definitely going to see a little bit of mixing and matching. I don't know if you'll you'll see Jonathan Jones on the field all that much in this game yeah. because I don't know, especially with the way he's struggled over the last couple of weeks, I don't know if the Patriots will want him covering Adam Thielen really at all right. and he's a slot guy we don't usually see him play on the outside much so I don't know might might not be a big week for him interested to see whether Duke Dawson gets in there at all because mm-hmm. we haven't seen him at all yet since he was um, uh, re- returned from IR added to the active roster because he was a healthy scratch this past week so we'll see they do have some options but but yeah that's I think that's definitely going to be kind of the number one uh, defensive matchup at least to watch this weekend I if I'm the Patriots I might just go all in on seeing what you have in J.C. Jackson before the end of the year. I think he's played really well so far this season. I mean, it's a limited sample size since he's played just over 100 snaps, uh, but he's been targeted 17 times, and his passer rating against is 37.7. He hasn't allowed a touchdown. Uh, He has two interceptions. He's toned down the penalties. He's only allowing a 52.9% catch rate. Uh, allowed 127 yards he's never allowed more than 35 yards in a game so I would almost make him maybe move I mean obviously your nickel cornerback is usually Deron Harmon but your nickel cornerback I guess I might make it JC Jackson moving forward until he shows that he's not fit for the role and then you kind of reset a little bit because you could always turn back to Jonathan Jones it's not like he's going to just go away Um, but I think that you know, Duke Dawson certainly has upside, but I think that J.C. Jackson has a lot of upside as a cornerback in this defense. I think the Patriots should probably see what they have in him because if he's as good as he's been so far and your top three cornerbacks are Stephon Gilmore, Jason McCourty, and J.C. Jackson, you can do a lot worse than that. And I will say one thing, J.C. Jackson is listed at 6'1", on certain, like, I think he's even listed on the Patriots roster as six foot one. Yeah. J.C. Jackson not six is foot not one. six foot one. He's like five foot ten. <laughs> so I think it was either at Florida or Maryland. Somehow he got listed at six foot one, and it's like just it's crazy. It. Yeah. yeah, that he's. So if you're looking at someone who could potentially cover like Adam Thielen, J.C. Jackson is not six foot one. <laughs> just as a just to let everyone know that as much as possible. 
Um, anything else on the Jets game before we move on? JC Jackson measured in at five foot ten at the combine. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Not not six foot one. No. Uh, no, I think we can move on. Uh, again, relatively standard Jets game. Um, this is basically kind of what you get every time the Patriots go down to uh, East Rutherford. Yes. Uh, let's get into Rex Burkhead for a little bit because the Patriots activated Rex Burkhead off of injured reserve, uh, and I I like Burkhead coming back. Because I think it, I wrote about that this, I wrote about this this week. I think it adds unpredictability to the Patriots offense because opposing defenses basically know that if James White is on the field, the Patriots are probably going to pass the ball. And if Sonny Michel is on the field, the Patriots are probably going to run the ball. I think that the Patriots pass 73% of the time that James White is on the field and they run 78% of the time when Sonny Michel is on the field. Last year, it was basically a 65 35 ratio. Uh, passing to running when Rex Burkhead was on the field. So I know that might not seem like a ton, but it makes a difference. And when Burkhead is on the field, opposing defenses won't know whether the Patriots are going to run the ball or pass the ball. And I don't expect him to play a ton, but I think that he can spell both White and Michelle at, at running back this season. Yeah, he's easily the most uh, versatile, at least at this point in his career. Maybe Sony Michelle can, yeah. can get there down the line. He has shown a little bit more um, kind of talent in the passing game over the last couple of weeks, but he's not at, at Rex Burkhead's level in that regard yet. Rex Burkhead is basically, I mean, he's a pretty even split to me in between running talent and, and receiving yeah. talent, as he showed last season. I mean, last year he carried the ball 64 times, caught uh, 30 passes on 36 targets, so he, he was really used kind of in both regards, and like you said, when he when he's on the field, the Patriots don't, or the, the team defending the Patriots mm-hmm. does not know where the ball is going which isn't always the case when James White is in there or when Sony Michelle is in there. I'm in, I'm interested to see how this whole kind of backfield shakes out. Mm-hmm. Adding even Cordell Patterson into this occasion in, into this equation too, because he was the Patriots' number one running back while Sony Michelle was out. <laughs> he is not the Patriots' number one running back anymore, but he's still getting substantial kind of backfield opportunities. They yeah. used him in uh, in short yardage uh, short yardage situations. I think three, maybe four times against the Jets the other day. Maybe those just completely dry up now that, that Rex Burkhead's back because mm-hmm. Burkhead did uh, see a lot of goal line carries last year, how he, that was how he racked up, I think. Uh, five touchdowns? Five touchdowns. Yeah. I think he had something like 10 touchdowns in, or eight touchdowns in 10 weeks or something mm-hmm. like that when he was healthy last year. Uh, so I'm interested to see how that works out. And I also just think it gives them some more kind of flexibility and, and, and kind of means to be more unpredictable. Like you, yeah. you can see uh, an occasion where they, they, the Patriots line up um, Cordell Patterson behind Tom Brady and then put Rex Burkhead in the slot. And right. then defense has to come out and then say, hey, maybe they could motion the other guys into it yeah. and maybe they can kind of just run out of that. So I think it just gives them gives Josh McDaniels another kind of tool and weapon uh, with, with which to play in, in this offense. It does <laughs> – it complicates matters in a number of ways with the Patterson being a running back slash wide receiver also because I was just thinking that – the Patriots will probably use uh, Rex Burkett in a decent amount of two running back sets, either yeah. sharing the field with Sonny Michelle or James White, probably with James White more than Sonny Michelle. But a lot of teams look at personnel splits and personnel packages when they're like game planning for teams. And, you know, okay, does this run, team run a lot of 11 personnel, 21 personnel, 13 personnel? Patterson makes it a lot more difficult to track that because. Yeah. Patterson's a wide receiver, so when he's on the field, like these these sites are going to categorize him as a wide receiver. But if he's in the backfield, then he's a running back. And even if he's split out at wide receiver, he's also kind of a running back because he could also just motion in a, in a running back. So I think it him being that you know chess piece that that Swiss Army knife really makes it hard to even prepare for certain situations and certain splits with the Patriots because you don't know how you're categorizing him and you you basically have to categorize him as two different players depending on where he is on the field. And like I said, he could always move wherever he's lining up. Yeah, the Patriots had a lot of success actually against the Jets lining him up as that sort of like H-back role yeah. kind of directly behind um, either, the right, either the right or left tackle. That, that's the formation they used um, when they got a couple of their long... Uh, their long play action gains. I think they had one to Gronk out of that formation and one to uh, either Edelman or Hogan. Yeah. And yeah, it just kind of adds a, a another 
wrinkle in there because I think you've you we've seen James Devlin line up there, we've seen Gronk line up there in the past. When you have a guy like like Patterson who can kind of do a lot of different things in there, just yeah, it complicates matters for the defense. Yeah, and it complicates matters for when you're trying to track those personnel packages too. Because yeah, yeah is, is he what the hell do you call him there? Yeah. yeah, do you call him a wide receiver, a tight end, a running back, a fullback, whatever? <laughs> like. Yeah, it's easy when if he's in the backfield versus yeah. split out wide, but if he's in that like kind of pseudo zone, then I don't know what you call. You just got to give him the ATH uh, designation. <laughs> yeah, athlete. pretty much, and I, I don't think that helps teams when they're trying to track yep. those types of things. Uh, we did get into the Vikings a little bit when te- talking about uh, Adam Thielen and how to prepare for them, but I mean the way that Bill Belichick talked about the Vikings this morning, uh, he, I think they already won the Super Bowl. I think so too. That's definitely the way he made it sound. He loves Mike Zimmer, thinks that he's one of the best coaches in the NFL. Uh, he seems to think the Vikings have more weapons than, like, the 1999 Rams <laughs> or something. Uh, commented on Kirk Cousins' high completion percentage. Uh, went on and on and on about the Vikings' front seven as well. And I mean, the, the Vikings' defense is definitely loaded. I think that once you get past Adam Thielen, Stephon Diggs, and um, Calvin Rudolph. Cook... Uh, Rudolph? Or- uh, yeah... Well, yeah, I mean... Talk- Rudolph, are you talking wide receiver-wise? I, w- I was thinking about overall offensive weapons. Oh, yeah. I think Rudolph is... Rudolph is, is good. I mean, he was a pro bowler last year. He's fine. Yeah, he's... He, he's not... He's Gronk, a little overrated. He's I not think, Gronk, yeah. Kelsey, Ertz level. Yeah, I, I just think... I thought that it's fair to categorize the, the Vikings' defense as being really dominant. I thought a little bit too much was made of the Vikings' offensive weapons, though. Yeah, I guess you could say that. I just... I, I do think that that Thielen and Diggs together are very yes. difficult to stop. Beyond that, I mean, yeah, they're, they're receivers beyond that. Laquan, Laquan, Laquan <laughs> that's, that was, man, I just pulled, pulled a cord, Corderell on that one. <laughs> Laquan, Treadwell, uh, Aldrick Robinson, they're, they're fine. They're, they're nothing special. Yeah. And, and like you said, yeah, Rudolph probably is a little bit overrated, at least at this point in his career. And Kirk Cousins has been good this year. Yeah. I, would, I would say he, he is having a, a good season. He's not having a fully guaranteed $84 million season, no. but he's he's been okay. I mean, he ranks basically near the top of the league in pretty much every um, passing category. I think it's uh, yards per attempt. He's pretty low, but everything else, yeah. he's he's top 10, basically. Uh, Vikings offensive line is very, very bad. Yeah. I mean, we were looking up there, kind of numbers on pro football focus earlier and at least in terms of pro football focus they really do not like the uh, the minnesota vikings offensive line no. um but yeah this is the the defense is still the strength of this team i don't know if you could say that it it maybe st- i don't know if it took a step back from last year but it hasn't right. been basically no. last year it was the jaguars and the vikings and then everybody else in terms of kind of defensive dominance hasn't really been the case this year but mm-hmm. but they have still been very still been very solid they've got Pro bowlers, all pros at, at all three uh, all three levels. They're best in the league on third down, best in the league uh, in the red zone. I sound like Bill Belichick right now. <laughs> but the fact that the Patriots have struggled in both of those areas recently I think is something that's definitely going to be worth watching uh, on Sunday. They haven't been great on third down, ha- third down, haven't been great in the red zone over the last four or five weeks. So uh, I think it's going to be a good game. I mean, I'm, I'm excited to watch this this Vikings team. They're always a uh, they're a fun offense to watch, if anything else, and, and they've definitely got some real playmakers on defense. I also think, uh, while we're similar to what I said about Kyle Rudolph, yeah, Kirk Cousins, I think, is a little bit overrated. I think that, you know, just from watching him, I think I was watching him pretty heavily against the Bears. It, he's just, he, he's a pretty average quarterback, I think. I think, I think His stats are great, but I would put him, like, in that average quarterback rating. I think he's actually properly rated because mm-hmm. I think this is what everybody says about Kirk I Cousins. guess that's true. Yeah. They were like, yeah, yeah, he's fine. Like, he's got good stats. He's he's a good quarterback. He's yeah. not in the kind of upper echelon Brady. I wouldn't call him top 10, I don't think. And that's without even, like, like, really right on top 10. Pro- he, he's probably, like, right on the, like, borderline of top 10 for me. I'd have to actually go look through all the quarterbacks. But he's fine. He's okay. He's yeah. he's not the reason the the... He's not going to be the reason the Vikings lose many games. He's he's fine. Right. Um, and then also, Belichick really was talking about uh, Delvin Cook a little bit today, and he's been very he's having a bad season. season. He's having a terrible season. He's averaging 3.5 yards per carry. And if he does t- not have a rushing touchdown, he has one receiving touchdown. Um, yeah. He's averaging 3.5 yards per carry, and he has one 70-yard run a couple weeks ago against the Lions. If you take that out, he's averaging 2.5 yards per carry. Yeah, I was just looking at his, his game log. is is pretty poor this season coming off that torn ACL. He also missed 
quite a few weeks with I forgot what the injury uh, hamstring he had. I believe hamstring injury he missed uh, I think all of October with a kind of nagging hamstring injury. The Patriots have been it seems like they're usually pretty good against a team starting running back and then like some other guy <laughs> might kind of chip in there and and pick up some yards. So like Corey Grant kind of thing. Right. I I actually yeah I, I think that this will definitely be a good game. I wouldn't be shocked though if this is a game where the Patriots just kind of trounce the Vikings. Just putting it all together in one game. Uh, it is a home game. Patriots have been really good at home this year. And I don't, I don't know. I, I just feel like this could be one of those games where the Patriots just put everything together and, and kind of trounce a team that's considered very good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it wouldn't be the first time we've seen the Patriots do something like that at this point in the season to a, uh, a kind of contender. I mean, if you, if you look at the, the Vikings' record right now, they're 6-4-1, and one, which is not great, but... One of their losses was a blowout loss to the Buffalo Bills, which, <laughs> which doesn't make bizarre, any sense yeah. at this point. But their other three losses were to really the best three teams in the NFC right now, in the Rams, Saints, and Bears. All those losses were by 10 or fewer points. So they've been in basically every game this season, yeah. uh, except for that, that Bills game back in Week 3. So I don't know. I, I guess I, I could see a, a blowout on the horizon, but I'm, I'm expecting a, a, a tighter contest. I, I want to actually get into this Kirk Cousins thing because we got some time right now. I, I want to I see where we actually have him right it because this isn't something that I think about very frequently, but Matt Ryan or Kirk Cousins? Matt Ryan. All right. Um, Cam Newton or Cam, Kirk Cousins? Cam Newton. Um, you would take Cousins over Trubisky, I would assume. At this point in his career. Mayfield yeah. or, or Kirk Cousins? Are oh, you saying right now? Yeah, or like projecting? right now. Right now, probably Cousins. Okay. I just um, haven't seen enough of Mayfield. Stafford or Kirk Cousins? Push. I think they're like. <laughs> I think Kirk Cousins and Matt Stafford are very, very similar. I would kind of agree. Rogers, you would take above yeah. uh, Deshaun Watson or Kirk Cousins. Watson. All right. Uh, Luck. I'm assuming about Luck, Kirk Cousins. Yeah. Uh, Mahomes. Yes. yes. Rivers. Yes, would yeah. be right. Goff. Yes. Um, Brady. Yes. Breeze. Yes. Wentz. I think I might go Cousins now, but they're they're also kind of close. Uh, Roethlisberger. Yes. yes, Wilson, yes, Mariota. I go Cousins there. That's tough, though. Yeah, so at the very, yeah, he would be somewhere around like 13 or something. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's when kind of splitting it hairs like between that, yeah. either like top 10 or average. He's kind of like, he really is sort of in that in-between period between being a top 10 quarterback and being a league average quarterback. Yeah. All right, I think that's pretty much it on the Vikings-Patriots matchup. Should be a good game. I don't know, even if it is blowout. We'll see. Uh, Want to play America's Favorite Game real quick? Yeah, let's do it. All right, this is where we guess where players that I have personally never heard of on the opposing team's roster went to school. And let's start off with cornerback Marcus Sherrills. Marcus Sherrills. He went to Michigan State. I am going to say Oregon. Let's see. Cornerback Marcus Sherrills went to Minnesota. Ah, I knew I knew it was Big Ten. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Uh, All right. How about tight end David Morgan the second? The second, not the first. Not the first. Not his father. The first. He went to Wyoming. Southwest Missouri State. I'm gonna guess. He went to UTSA. Ah, You were close. I was close. (laughs) All right, now this is one. This is a guy who does not even have a Wikipedia page. It's going to be the last one that we do. Vikings cornerback Craig James. Craig James. He went to... Hmm. Craig James went to uh, Appalachian State. I'm going to guess Furman. This has got to be someone... I hope he went to SMU. (laughs) True. All right. Craig James, Vikings. It makes it more difficult when they're not on Wikipedia. <laughs> Southern Illinois. Southern Illinois. Mm. I don't think I've ever even heard of Southern ah, Illinois. Ah, the Salukis. The Salukis. All right. Well, that was America's Favorite Game. I hope that you guys all enjoyed that and played along at home. Uh, and if you got anything right, let us know. And I'll probably not believe you, but you can tell me anyway. Uh, anything else that you wanted to say, Zach, before we go? No, I think that wraps it up. I think that does as well. Uh, follow along with all of our Patriots coverage at Nesson.com. Follow me on Twitter at Doug Kide. Follow Zach on Twitter at Zach Cox Nesson. 
and we will be back next week to recap this game and preview the Patriots' upcoming game against the Dolphins. I had to think of the last second about who the Patriots are playing next week. All right, bye.